he should have stayed home. Creeks knew of him for miles before he came into town, dreamed of silver blades and crosses, and knew he was one of the ones who yearned for something his heart wasn't big enough to handle. And De Soto thought it was gold. The Creeks lived in earth towns, not gold, spun children, not gold. That's not what De Soto thought he wanted to see. The Creeks knew it and drowned him in the Mississippi River so he wouldn't have to drown himself. Welcome to Worth Quoting. I'm Mary Sue Keppel, the editor of Calliope, a journal of women's art published by Florida Community College and distributed nationwide. And with me this afternoon is Joy Harjo, a wonderful Amer Native American poet who is coming to give a reading with us at FCCJ tonight and has graciously said that she would be part of our um, TV show. Joy has published a number of books which have received awards. One of them is She Had Some Horses. In Mad Love and War is another for which she has received numerous awards. Secrets from the Center of the World and What Moon Drove Me to This. You were mentioning that In Mad Love and War received five awards. Would you tell us about that, Joy? Yes, I think there were awards that were awarded directly for the book and then, and then because of the book. Mm -hmm. And they included uh, the William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America, um, the Delmar Schwartz Award from mm -hmm. NYU, New mm -hmm. York City, and um, the Josephine Miles Poetry Award from Penn, the writer's organization, mm -hmm. Penn West, mm -hmm. and uh, Oakland Penn, I'm sorry. Oakland Penn. And um, American Book Award from Before Columbus Foundation. And uh, the, I know the Mountains and Plains Booksellers Award. How wonderful. You were yeah. also um, interviewed by Bill Moyers for The Power of the Word, were yes. you not? Mm -hmm. that, that was wonderful. You um, go around the United States and give workshops and readings to a lot of community colleges, to university students, as well as work with a few high school students, as I understand as uh -huh. well. Yeah, that's, that's true. Neat. Would you tell us a little bit, Joy, about your background? Well, it was interesting driving around this area because it part of, you know, half myself or it seems like my soul yes. <laughs> start originates in this area which was um, originally uh, Muscogee Territory. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we ranged down this far and then a lot of people after the removal process started in the United States uh, were forced, you know, either forced Oklahoma or forced down mm -hmm. this way. So. You know, I'm a member of the Creek Tribe, or the Muscogee is the name we call ourselves, from mm -hmm. Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm also a mixed blood. My mother is uh, Cherokee, French, and, and uh, Irish, and my father is uh, Muscogee. Totally. Not totally, he has some English, ah. but that's the culture. Mm -hmm. And you grew up in the culture of the Native American? I grew up as a Muscogee person in America, so I think like most Native peoples in this country, we're dual, dual cultures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's uh, like one is the heart culture, or you know, what you what provide is the one that provides the base, and then there's the one that everyone deals with in the in the more obvious world. I was going to say the real world, but it's not the real world. <laughs> it's not the real no. world, no. And, and that heritage is so um, prevalent in almost every poem that I've read that you've written. How does the heritage affect what you write? Well, is there any easy way to answer that? Well, it's like anybody else. I mean, it's like asking um, a Jewish writer from New York, well, how does your heritage affect your writing? Well, it just is. Or anybody in yeah. you know, a Southern, you know, asking Faulkner or, you know, anyone else, yeah. how does it? It's just part of it. And it's not, 
I don't like the word heritage so much because it sounds like it's removed or, mm -hmm. you know, our ancestry. People ask me about my ancestry. It's not that. That's who I am. Yeah. You know, that kind of removes it and uh, it's very alive. It's not something that's something remembered from a long time ago, but my tribe is very active. The tribal ceremonies are still ongoing. There's, okay. It's a very uh, fluid and alive system that goes on, you know, that goes on in the middle of um, this crazy America. When you write, I've read much that you have to say about the landscape, and, and your landscape is a landscape, I, I suspect, of the Southwest. Mm -hmm. That's what comes through much of your poetry. Mm -hmm. Would you talk to us a little bit about the meaning of the landscape in your writing? Well, the land is everything we are. Mm -hmm. You know, in this culture, in the obvious culture, there aren't, there aren't places in the culture for including that or honoring or praising or recognizing that knowledge. But if you think about it, you know, it's, it's like taking part in something and not saying thank you. Mm. You know, it's like taking it in and, and not considering. It would be like your mother giving you all of these gifts and, and you just walk away from it or you walk away from the table or you walk without mm -hmm. any kind of gratitude or without any kind of reciprocation. And that's what's going on right now in overall in, in um, this, um, you know, industrialized society. I mean, you look around and absolutely, you know, you, the jewelry you have on, we have on, the clothes we wear, the glasses, the, you know, our bodies, uh, flowers, you know, even fake flowers, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> table, the books, everything we have has come from the land, mm -hmm. you know, working in conjunction with the sun and other elements, but it all originates there. Mm -hmm. And so it is, you know, even at that basic level, it's most it's it's crucial and it it's uh, it's the beginning point of everything and landscapes have influenced humans i mean we cannot exist without them we are inside them and there's a kind of reciprocal uh, relationship that is there you're probably talking about something much deeper than what i'm just going to give as an example i moved from wisconsin to florida and I did not know what was putting the pressure on me, but I was so much aware of the fact that the world was hemming me in. I could not take a deep enough breath. And I realized when, after I was here for six months, I flew back to Maine, and I had done a lot of work in, in Maine. And as I was landing in Maine and got into a taxi cab, I could see for miles. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had this grand vista. And I began to cry in, in the, the car. The tears were just streaming down my cheeks. And the cab driver said, are you going to a funeral? And I said, no, I'm just breathing the fresh air. I, I, I can see. And it was a, a very terrifying thing for me to come back to Florida and realize that I never was on a hill. I was mm -hmm. always hemmed in by the trees. Now, in, South, in the Southwest, mm -hmm. you have a totally different experience of what the landscape is, and that shows up in so many of your beautiful poems. Yeah, there's something about it. I remember I dreamed about New Mexico before I went there, and uh -huh. I wound up... Um, well, Oklahoma, I'm from Oklahoma, and I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and raised there till high school when I was sent to Indian boarding school in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. But I had dreamed that landscape, and I remember driving out, and the land opened, there was something that opened up, and the quality of light changed. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it was uh, everything I had expected in some way or had imagined. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, grown into a place that, it's a place that, that feeds me and on all levels. Mm -hmm. And um, it's deeply moving. And there's something about the light there that is unlike the light anywhere else. It was close. The quality of light was close. The closest I found was when I was in Barcelona, Spain in mm. February. It was close. I remember landing and thinking, this is the light is similar to New Mexico. And that's why you have a lot of writers mm -hmm. and artists and, and so on living there because of the quality of light. Yet, you know, I always owe something to Oklahoma. And then when I come back to this part of the world, I always feel something deep, very deep speaking to me. Mm -hmm. Something very old and, and uh, beyond me in a way. 
Your poems speak to that. Would you mind reading a poem for us? Okay. And in fact, um, you're going to be reading several poems, and I think the first one this Probably afternoon can. is She Had Some Horses. Well, maybe in light of what we just said, and uh, maybe New Orleans, Okay. starting from here. Please. Okay. It would be wonderful. The New Orleans poem. Yeah, because this poem came out of my first visit to New Orleans, and um, I felt it was the it was uh, the first time I had come to this part of the United mm -hmm. States, of which, you know, there's a lot of fam my family history centers and from Alabama and Georgia, that whole area, mm -hmm. those areas, which were our homelands. Mm -hmm. And um, I, my great grandfather, uh, my father's mother's uh, father, was Manawi. He was one of the leaders of the Red Stick War, who fought in an armed resistance against uh, Andrew Jackson, the U.S. government, against the move to, um, to Oklahoma, or Indian Territory, as it was then. Yeah, so when I went to New right. Orleans, I walked around looking for other creeks and smelling it out. And I knew there had been, I felt, that, I knew that there had been some connection. And later I found out that one of the removal trails went through New Orleans. And you knew that when you got there. Uh-huh. So I, I went walking around, walked down to the Mississippi River, and I started remembering a story about this explorer named De Soto. Because in when I grew up in Tulsa, in the Tulsa Public Schools, we learned about Columbus, mm -hmm. you know, lies about Columbus, and about these explorers. But we didn't learn, you know, I didn't learn about Manawi in school. I learned about him, you know, through family stories. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I, I, from what I'd remember, De Soto had, you know, was an explorer looking for gold, and he, um, he uh, never made it back home. He was uh, killed or drowned by the, it was either the Choctaws or the Chickasaws. Mm -hmm. But I used my poetic license, and I said the Creeks did it. Okay. New Orleans. This is the South. I look for evidence of other Creeks for remnants of voices, or for tobacco brown bones to come wandering down Conti Street, Royale, or Decatur. Near the French market, I see a blue horse caught frozen in stone in the middle of a square. Brought in by the Spanish on an endless ocean voyage, he became mad and crazy. They caught him in blue rock, said, don't talk. I know it wasn't just a horse that went crazy. Nearby is a shop with ivory and knives. There are red rocks. The man behind the counter has no idea that he is inside magic stones. He should find out before they destroy him. These things have memory, you know. I have a memory. It swims deep in blood, a delta in the skin. It swims out of Oklahoma, deep the Mississippi River carries my feet to these places, the French Quarter, stale rooms, the sun behind thick and moist clouds, and I hear boats hauling themselves up and down the river. My spirit comes here to drink. My spirit comes here to drink. Blood is the undercurrent. There are voices buried in the Mississippi mud. There are ancestors and future children buried beneath the current stirred up by pleasure boats going up and down. There are stories here made of memory. I remember De Soto. He is buried somewhere in this river. His bones sunk like the golden treasure he traveled half the earth to find. C came looking for gold cities, for shining streets of beaten gold to dance on with silk ladies. He should have stayed home. Creeks knew of him for miles before he came into town, dreamed of silver blades and crosses, and knew he was one of the ones who yearned for something his heart wasn't big enough to handle. And De Soto thought it was gold. The Creeks lived in earth towns, not gold. Spun children, not gold. That's not what De Soto thought he wanted to see. The Creeks knew it and drowned him in the Mississippi River so he wouldn't have to drown himself. Maybe his body is what I am looking for as evidence to know in another way that my memory is alive. But he must have got away somehow because I have seen New Orleans, the lace and silk buildings, trolley cars on beaten silver paths, 
Graves that rise up out of soft earth in the rain. Shops that sell black mammy dolls holding white babies. And I know I have seen De Soto having a drink on Bourbon Street, mad and crazy, dancing with a woman as gold as the river bottom. That's so powerful. When you write and you use a word like an eye in there and, and the reader is hearing the eye, there's certainly a sense of identification with that eye. Who do you mean is the eye? Well, it's not just me. Right. I you know, that. and I, I mytholo mythologize and fictionalize and add, but fictionalize, but the truth, you know, mm -hmm. I always stay mm -hmm. hard up against the truth. So your audience would be, is, is your audience mainstream America? Is your audience... I think the kernel, I mean, my heart audience, at least the first audience, and I think that, yes, I want to reach mainstream America. Yeah. But, you know, first of all, it's like the inner circle is, is Indian people. Mm -hmm. And I think of the first audience I had when I started writing, when I first learned of uh, what happened when you could put words to paper, is that the experiences weren't just mine, they weren't I, mm -hmm. the I, but they were the experiences of other young Native women, you know, who were my, mm -hmm. con my peers at the University of New Mexico when I was a student, when we were involved in... Um, uh, in our in a, in a struggle to change the world for our families and our children so that the devastation and the loss that had been suffered could be mm -hmm. walked through and we could come through it alive together because it's mm -hmm. not there's no I that will ever survive you know as I mm -hmm. and so my first audience was that circle you know who would you know Monday we gather and tell all the stories from the weekend and you know it was always some storytelling going on and my poetry came out of, that's what fed my poetry, and that's kind of what my poetry came out of, because before that time I was a painter. I come from a family of painters. My grandmother, Naomi Harjo, was a painter, and uh, my father's side of the family is very well educated. They, uh, both her and my aunt, had their BFAs in art, you know, from, uh, I think, univers not University of Oklahoma, but Oklahoma City University, I believe, something like that, in the, you know, 30s. 20s, 30s. My mother's family, I don't know of anyone who has a degree from there. And, you know, eighth, my mother had an eighth grade education and grew up in extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. My father, the Creek side, were very wealthy. Isn't that something? Yeah. Would you read us another poem that perhaps came out of that same experience? Is, is one of these that you had decided to read to us something that also came out of that? A small group of, of women who were thinking and feeling together at the university? You know, the book that came, the first book, which I don't have with me, that came out of that was the, well, I had a chat book, The Last uh -huh. Song, and then What Moon did, Drove Me to This. Ah. But I feel like they're, you know, everywhere. I mean, it's, we've all, um, we've all held on to those values, and I think that integrity, at least, you know, I try to keep that as my <laughs> center in which, you know, we feel that all human beings, all human beings are worthy. And um, I know, you know, when one uh, woman is teaching at a, at, you know, working at a school, another one has gone on, she's doing a lot of uh, active mm -hmm. work on, a lot of them have turned into political activists, mm -hmm. um, you know, healers, artists, but I have one that directly comes out of that and that kind of work, which is okay. Strange Fruit. Please. And I talk about, this one was not, uh, I understood that uh, there was a, a place that, um, it was a newspaper in a town that I'd been associated with, I'm not going to name the town, and uh, somebody asked, uh, someone on the staff says, why haven't you reviewed In Mad Love and War? You know, after all, you know, she's part of our community, and they said, well, I, w I was told that a woman said there said that, that I had made up this, this poem and that it was a lie. Oh, dear. And this poem came out of um, a shock. It was a shocking response to some, it was a res response to something shocking I'd heard, which was um, I was watching CNN one day while I was cleaning house. It was the only time I turned the TV on, and mm -hmm. over the wires came this one line, and I didn't, you know, which was a young woman, a young black woman was lynched today. There was no name, 
no place, nothing. I tried for two months to find out mm. those. It took me two months to find out. But the poem came early one morning. I didn't, it just, the poem came. I wasn't even thinking, but it had been buried. It had disturbed me so deeply that it, it came out of the deep mm. in that way. And it was for Jacqueline Peters. She was a young black woman who was uh, canvassing a neighborhood, not in the South, but in California, Lafayette, California. She was trying to start an NAACP chapter. And because of that, she was lynched and hanged in an olive tree in 1986. That's so devastating. I hope you read that poem to us, will you? Yes. It's called Strange Fruit, you know, which is a song Billie Holiday sang, yeah. which deals with the lynching. I was out in the early evening taking a walk in the fields to think about this poem I was writing or walking to the store for a pack of cigarettes, a pound of bacon. How quickly I smelled evil, then saw the hooded sheets right up in the not yet darkness, in the dusk carrying the moon, in the dust behind my tracks. Last night, there were crosses burning in my dreams, and the day before, a black cat stood in the middle of the road with a ghost riding its back. Something knocked on the window at midnight. My lover told me, shush, we have too many stories to carry on our backs like houses. We have struggled too long to let the monsters steal our sleep, sleep, go to sleep. But I never woke up. Dogs have been nipping at my heels since I was learned to walk. I was taught not to dance for a rotten supper on the plates of my enemies. My mother taught me well. I have not been unkind to the dead, nor have I been stingy with the living. I have not been with anyone else's husband or anyone else's wife. I need a song. I need a cigarette. I want to squeeze my baby's leg, see her turn into a woman just like me. I want to dance under the full moon or in the early morning on my lover's lap. See this scar under my arm? It's from tripping over a rope when I was small. I was always a little clumsy and my long lean feet like my mother's have always known where to take me to where the sweet things grow. Some grow on trees and some grow in other places, but not this tree. I didn't do anything wrong. I did not steal from your mother. My brother did not take your wife. I did not break into your home, tell you how to live or die. Please go away, hooded ghost from hell on earth. I only want heaven in my baby's arms, my baby's arms. Down the road through the trees, I hear, see the kitchen light on and my lover fixing supper, the baby fussing for her milk, waiting for me to come home. The moon hangs from the sky like a swollen fruit. My feet betray me, dance anyway from this killing tree. And how can one speak after that? We all have to. Uh, yes, yeah. we have to. I mean, life has to continue, and people have to accept what is evil in the world. And, and I suspect that writing about it and talking about it and telling about it is one way to somehow abolish it a speck. Yeah, I guess it's not even accept that there is evil in the world, but acknowledge, mm -hmm. yeah. acknowledge it. Because yeah. how else do you make sense of, of racism? There's yeah, no, absolutely. there's no logic to it. None. You know, if you would, before we finish, read She Had Some Horses, okay. because that whole experience of who a person is, the good and the bad, the, the acceptable, and, and that which a person would like to just travel down into one's toes and stamp on with the other feet uh -huh. is, is all there. So would you read it to us, please? Okay. Thank you. She had some horses. She had horses who were bodies of sand. She had horses who were maps drawn of blood. She had horses who were skins of ocean water. She had horses who were the blue air of sky. She had horses who were fur and teeth. She had horses who were clay and would break. She had horses who were splintered red cliff. She had some horses. She had horses with long pointed breasts. She had horses with full brown thighs. She had horses who laughed too much. 
She had horses who threw rocks at glass houses. She had horses who licked razor blades. She had some horses. She had horses who danced in their mother's arms. She had horses who thought they were the sun and their bodies shone and burned like stars. She had horses who waltzed nightly on the moon. She had horses who were much too shy and kept quiet in stalls of their own making. She had some horses. She had horses who liked creek stomp dance songs. She had horses who cried in their beer. She had horses who spit at male que queens who made them afraid of themselves. She had horses who said they weren't afraid. She had horses who lied, who were stripped. She had horses who told the truth, who were stripped bare of their tongues. She had some horses. She had horses who called themselves horse. She had horses who called themselves spirit and kept their voices secret into themselves. She had horses who had no names. She had horses who had books of names. She had some horses. She had horses who whispered in the dark, who were afraid to speak. She had horses who screamed out of fear of the silence, who carried knives to protect themselves from ghosts. She had horses who waited for destruction. She had horses who waited for resurrection. She had some horses. She had horses who got down on their knees for any savior. She had horses who thought their high price had saved them. She had horses who tried to save her, who climbed in her bed at night and prayed as they raped her. She had some horses. She had some horses she loved. She had some horses she hated. These were the same horses. Thank you. And this was Joy Harjo, and we were on Worth Quoting, and I am Mary Sue Keppel. Thank you for joining us. We were sponsored today by Florida Community College at Jacksonville, by Open Campus, and by Calliope, a journal of women's art. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.